Here in America, Thanksgiving is nearly upon us, and that means football, familial arguments, and fattening ourselves up on turkey, stuffing, and pumpkin pie. So today, we are making one of the first recipes for that dessert, pumpkin pie. That's right, a recipe so old that they hadn't even added the K yet. Pumpkin pie, this time on Tasting History. Today's recipe comes from the 1670 cookbook The Queen-Like Closet by Hannah Woolley. To make a pumpkin pie. Take a pumpkin, pare it, and cut it in thin slices. Dip it in beaten eggs and herbs, shred small, and fry it till it be enough. Then lay it into a pie with butter, raisins, currants, sugar, and sack. And in the bottom some sharp apples. When it is baked, butter it and serve it in. So this is a good example of why sometimes with historic recipes they need to like really kind of be reordered uh, because she, she's, she talks about putting the pumpkin and the sugar and all of the ingredients into the pie and then she says, oh, by the way, there also needs to be apples underneath all of that filling. So if you were going in order, you'd be pretty aggravated trying to slip apples underneath uh, that wet pumpkin filling. Anyway, for today's recipe, you will need one sugar or pie pumpkin, two sharp apples, I used Granny Smith, but really any apple is going to do just fine for this, three eggs, two handfuls of freshly minced herbs. Now she's not specific as to what herbs to use. I am using rosemary, thyme, and parsley because uh, there are other contemporary pumpkin pie recipes that do mention what to use. Uh, some of them also mention sweet marjoram, but I couldn't find any for that. So uh, use whatever you like. Six tablespoons or 85 grams of salted butter, one third cup or 50 grams of raisins, one third cup or 50 grams of currants, one half cup or 100 grams of sugar, one fourth cup or 60 milliliters sack or sherry, and then some sort of crust. She's not specific as to what crust to use. Um, she mentions different crusts throughout the book, so it's kind of anyone's guess. What we do know simply from reading other recipes in the book is that she's not talking about a self-standing uh, crust, which she refers to as a coffin. This would definitely be made in a dish. Uh, she also talks about covering or lidding up pies throughout the book. So since she doesn't talk about that in this recipe, we can infer that this has no top. So first, set your oven to 425 degrees Fahrenheit or 220 degrees Celsius. Then line a pie dish with your dough. Now at this point, it's really up to you if you want to blind bake this crust. It's actually not necessary for this recipe. Um, I didn't, but it's always a good practice. I probably should have. So uh, go ahead and do it if you want, but really it's up to you. Now it's time to seed and pair our pumpkins. And I can just tell you right now, it's a bit of a pain in the pumpkin. First, slice off the top stem, trying to cut as little of the pumpkin flesh as possible. Now with either a knife or a potato peeler, peel the skin off of the pumpkin. Then going down the middle, carefully slice the pumpkin in two. I nearly lost a finger, so be careful. Then with a spoon, carve out the seeds and the guts of the pumpkin. Peel off the pumpkin skin, rip out its guts. It's really quite violent and macabre, isn't it? Anyway, those seeds, of course, you can go ahead and eat, especially if you have a tapeworm. Allow me to elucidate. In an article from 1892, Dr. H. Romer recommends the peeled seeds of the common pumpkin as an effective and safely acting tenefuge. The result is astonishingly good. The writer has expelled over 100 tapeworms in this manner. So yeah, gets rid of tapeworms. That's pretty cool. And I guess it actually works uh, due to the bitter resin in the seeds. But you know what? If you have a parasite, I'd still recommend going to a doctor. Anyway, once your pumpkin is cleaned of its seeds, go ahead and slice the halves again and make yourself a little Pac-Man. Then once you're done playing with your food, go ahead and slice it up. Now you wanna make sure these slices are fairly thin so the pumpkin gets cooked all the way through. Next, go ahead and peel your apples, core them, and slice them thin just as you did the pumpkin. Then set a large skillet over medium heat and melt two tablespoons of the butter. Now, depending on how much pumpkin you end up having, you may need more than two tablespoons. You can also use oil. Um, she's actually not specific. In fact, she probably used lard. So if you got lard, go ahead and use that. Um, but yeah, just be flexible, just enough to get it fried. Now, while that heats up, go ahead and beat your eggs and then mix in the herbs. 
Then dip the pumpkin slices into the egg. When you take them out, try to get some of the herbs, but try not to get too much of the egg because the egg ends up just kind of scrambling if you get too, too much. Then place them in the hot skillet. Now, depending on the size of the pumpkin and the size of your skillet, you may need to do this in a couple batches uh, just so everything gets cooked. She just says, fry it till it be enough. Very helpful, Ms. Woolley, but um, I don't know what that means. What I took it as is pretty much cooked all the way through until it's fairly soft so that when you're mixing it with the other ingredients, it, it mixes rather than like still having slices of pumpkin. I fried mine for about 10 minutes, which did the trick. Once all of your pumpkin is fried, put the slices into a large bowl and add two more tablespoons of the butter, holding back the final two for once the pie is baked. Then add the raisins, the currants, the sugar, and the sack or sherry, and mix everything together. Then line the bottom of your prepared pie crust with the apple slices and pour the pumpkin filling over it, smoothing the top. Then set it in the oven. Now you're gonna bake that for about 20 minutes at that full temperature, and then you're going to reduce the temperature to 375 degrees Fahrenheit or 190 Celsius and bake for another 40 to 50 minutes. Now while our pie bakes, make sure to hit that subscribe button as we tuck in to the history of pumpkin pie. Now to get to the history of pumpkin pie, we have to start with the history of pumpkins. It would have been weird if I had said anything else there. Pumpkins were first cultivated in southern Mexico and Central America around 5000 BC. The Aztecs would stuff the flesh of the fruit into folded corn tortillas and then bake them, a bit like an early cheeseless quesadilla. And one of the first foods mentioned by the Spanish on their arrival in the Yucatan was for a Mayan dish called papazules, which were corn tortillas dipped in a pepita or pumpkin seed sauce. A modern version that's stuffed is still made today in the same area. Now, the Spanish must have loved these pumpkins because they're one of the first fruits that they brought back to Europe to grow. Now, the first recipes that I could find for pumpkin pie came from the Opera di Bartolomeo Scappi from 1570. Now, I went into detail about this amazing and famous cookbook just a few weeks ago, so if you missed that episode, uh, there's a link up here and in the description. Make sure to watch it. It was really, really interesting, if I do say so myself. Anyway, Scopi has several different recipes for pumpkin torts, or cakes, or pies. Uh, the meaning is kind of nebulous at that point. Um, one of them has pumpkin and onion, so kind of savory. And then one of them is made with pumpkin and creamy cheeses and eggs and sugar, and kind of sounds like an early pumpkin cheesecake. And I really think I need to make that. Now at school, I was taught that just 50 years after Scopi was making his pumpkin pies, the Pilgrims and the Wampanoag were eating their own pumpkin pie at that very first Thanksgiving at Plymouth Rock. That is incorrect. In fact, there were a lot of things that school totally got wrong about uh, that, that meal and everything surrounding it, but that's, that's for a different episode. Maybe next year I'll go into detail and, and kind of go off on that. But all I'll say for now is that they were definitely not eating pumpkin pies or any pies at that first Thanksgiving because they didn't have any flour for crust, they didn't have any sugar for filling, and they didn't have ovens for baking. In fact, they were rather woefully unprepared for their trip to the New World. I would say that the venture seemed a little half-baked, but you'd need an oven for that. But while they didn't eat pumpkin pie, they did eat pumpkin, because the Wampanoag had been growing them in the area for centuries. And they not only ate the pumpkin, but they used the pumpkin itself as a serving vessel, kind of like a, a pumpkin bowl. And all the way through the 19th century, that was a very popular way of using pumpkins to serve other pies, or pumpkin pies, or pumpkin soups, inside of the baked pumpkin. Now soon after the pilgrims did not eat pumpkin pie, the French and the English did. Likely influenced by Scapi, in 1651, François-Pierre Laferraine published his seminal work, Le Cuisiné François, which laid the foundations for French gastronomy. And it had effects on French cuisine which ripple down to us even to this day. I really think that I should do an entire episode just on this book, so if you'd like to see that, let me know in the comments. His recipe for torte de pompion called for boiling the pumpkin in milk and then filling a pie paste with it, sugar, butter, and almonds. Mmm, c'est magnifique, non? 
Two years later, his cookbook was translated into English, and it influenced British cookbooks for centuries to come. Pretty much every book after that point had some recipe for a pumpkin pie. And in 1685, we finally see a rather familiar flavor profile accompany the pumpkin. In Robert May's The Accomplished Cook, he adds cinnamon, nutmeg, and clove. Then all you have to add is a little bit of ginger, and pumpkin spice would be born. Hey Robert May, there's a new announcement. You basic. But even with Mr. May's addition of an early pumpkin spice flavor, these pumpkin pies wouldn't be anything like you'd recognize today. And that's because today we eat pumpkin custard pies. And to get one of those, we have to cross back over the pond to America. In one of the great early American cookbooks, American Cookery, published in 1796, Amelia Simmons includes two recipes for pumpkin pie. Two points for Amelia for the addition of a K. Minus one for spelling pumpkin with an O. But spelling aside, these recipes are the first time that we really see a pumpkin custard pie. And after that, that becomes the standard for a pumpkin pie. And it becomes a focal point of New England holiday traditions. See, Thanksgiving, even after the pilgrims, stuck around, but only in New England. There are numerous 19th century references from New England to the holiday and to pumpkin pie itself. Famously, in Lydia Marie Child's poem, Over the River and Through the Woods, which ends, Hurrah for the fun is the pudding done, hurrah for pumpkin pie. And in the 1827 novel Northwood by Sarah Josepha Hale, speaking of Thanksgiving, she says, there was a huge plum pudding, custards, and pies of every name and description ever known in Yankee land. Yet the pumpkin pie occupied the most distinguished niche. Fun fact, Miss Hale also wrote Mary Had a Little Lamb. Anyway, both of those mentions seem charming and innocuous, but they actually ended up being rather political. See, both authors were well-known abolitionists, and so not much loved by the southern states. And at the same time, Ms. Hale was petitioning presidents to have the New England tradition of Thanksgiving become a national holiday. Well, the southern states took umbrage, and they wanted nothing to do with abolition, nor the New England holiday of Thanksgiving, nor that infernal Yankee pumpkin pie. They had their sweet potato pies, and the pumpkin pie, sweet potato pie, Cold War still rages on in households to this day every Thanksgiving. It was only in 1863, after 17 years of trying to get the holiday nationalized, that Abraham Lincoln finally listened to Miss Hale and declared the last Thursday of November a national day of Thanksgiving. Now, before we get back to our own pumpkin pie, I want to leave you with the lyrics to a young soldier's ballad professing his love of pumpkin pie from the 1889 Canadian light opera, Leo the Royal Cadet. Farewell, O oh fragrant pumpkin pie, dyspeptic pork, adieu. Though to the college halls I hie, on field of battle, though I die, my latest sob, my latest sigh, shall wafted be to you. And my love, my little Nell, the apple of my eye, to thee how can I say farewell? I love thee more than I can tell, I love thee more than anything but pie. Now, I would have sung that, but I couldn't find the music to the opera, just the lyrics. So if anyone has the sheet music or a recording of Leo the Royal Cadet, please send it my way. Anyway, let's get our pumpkin pie out of the oven. So start checking the pie around 40 minutes, and once you see it's nice and bubbly on the top, take it out of the oven and put the last two tablespoons of butter on the top. And then let it cool. Now I am excited to see what our 400-year-old pumpkin pie recipe tastes like, but if you're looking for something a little more traditional, yet still historical, I am going to link to my friend Jill's channel, Yester Kitchen, where she delves into the history and stories behind recipes from America in the 1940s through the 1980s. Isn't that right, Jill? That's right, Max. On Yester Kitchen, I will be making a spectacular, boozy pumpkin pie from the man, the myth, the legend himself. James Beard. And of course, I'll be talking a little bit about this food icon's extraordinary career. I will see you over there. So for Jill's version of pumpkin pie, make sure to click on her video, which is down in the description. As for ours, it is time to eat. So here it is, pumpkin pie. It obviously looks very different from a modern day pumpkin pie. It's, it's much more layered. I mean, well, it's not a custard, so, uh, it, you know, it, it's more like a bit of a jumble, but it's kind of pretty. It's, um, it's very orange. Actually, more orange, <laughs> I think, than, than a modern-day pumpkin pie. Uh, let's give it a shot here. 
Mm. 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 That is so good. <laughs> oh, that is so good. So much of the apple is coming through. You get the pumpkin, but you get the apple. And what a wonderful combination. Why don't we put apple in pumpkin pie anymore? It's a perfect combo. Even though it's not smooth like a custard pumpkin pie, it sticks together. It's, it's not like falling apart or anything. And it's just, it's soft and wow. I, I actually might like this more than regular pumpkin pie and I love regular pumpkin pie. This is fan friggin' tastic. Um, and the bottom is cooked. I didn't, I didn't pre-bake it or blind bake it, it's cooked. Uh, but go ahead and do it if, if you feel more comfortable. Either way, this is so delicious. You gots to make this. Uh, make this for Thanksgiving, make this after Thanksgiving, make this any time of the year, if you can find pumpkins. Maybe stick to around Thanksgiving, I suppose. Anyway, make sure to like this video and I will see you next time on Tasting History. It's seriously so good. <laughs>